about the topic this year, I said, Dr. Strong, give me day two. I want drama. <laughs> And 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 when I when I he said, well, no, that's already taken. And I said, wow. And I said, well, I struggle with contemplative practices. I've been struggling for six years with this. Um, and so, as many of you guys know, in SOP, the first quarter that we're here, we take a class with Dr. Strawn, and this is an assignment that we have. And I don't know if you were like me. I'm like, oh, God, I don't have time for this. I don't want to do this. Um, and so I'll, I'll give you a little bit about a background about me and my journey with contem contemplative practices. When I came here, I was a mother of four and I was pregnant. And so the concept of pulling away, <laughs> when you talk about it being revolutionary for a woman to be still, I was almost offended at the idea of stillness. And, but this, this continues to haunt me. God continues to call me, call us as students to do the work ourselves. Because as you said, we cannot lead where we have not gone. And so my, what I want to present today is my struggle with mindfulness, spiritual practices, spiritual disciplines, and I'm, I'm so grateful for the work that we're doing here at Fuller and just having the, the privilege of studying such topics. And clearly God is calling me to it because it ended up that I ended up doing research on this very topic as it relates to spiritual transcendence and virtue development and the correlation between spiritual disciplines, mindfulness, and um, having a greater sense of how we are embedded in a greater narrative, a biblical narrative, so that we can impact those that we serve. So as you can see with that, I, I thought I was going to study emotional regulation <laughs> when I came here, but God had another plan for me. And it is related because, you, as you say, um, mindfulness, con contemplative practices help us to become more regulated ourselves, become more attuned to our bodily experiences, um, our spirituality as we're working with other people. And so it is all related. Um, but as you also say, we like to intellectualize things and talk about those things out there in our clients, knowing that we struggle within ourselves as psychology students, as theologians, and as people who serve members of our community. And so I want to thank you for naming the struggle for me because it is not normally named. We go to all these conferences, we hear about, we take Dr. Um, Tan CBT class and we learn about all these techniques, but we don't talk about the struggle that we have as clinicians in training. And so from what I understand, virtue development is, I understand it as um, excellent, praiseworthy moral dispositions that come through the um, practice over and over again of mindfulness and being in God's presence. And it transforms who we are from the inside and it impacts the work that we do and how we interact with our, our communities and our environment. And so virtue development is a product of ongoing disciplines and practices. And so Christ-likeness actually is formed in us, greater Christ-likeness through these practices, but yet we struggle. And I, I as I was preparing for today, I, I was in this SOP lounge, as I usually am, to avoid driving in traffic. And another student came in and we talked about this and I saw the same angst on her face as I often have when I'm thinking about pulling away and actually being still. And I said, there's something to this that we're not naming. And so again, clearly God's calling me to this. I'm currently taking a Martin Luther King class and I had never, I've heard many things about Dr. King, but I'd never heard about his 10 commandments of nonviolence. And the first commandment is meditate daily on teachings in life, in the life of Jesus. And then in the course, I learned about Gandhi and the six principles of nonviolence, again, rooted in con con contemplative practices. And so we as um, students here at Fuller, no matter what side of the campus you're on, we are privileged to be able to engage such topics and it's really a responsibility that we have, an opportunity to be the answer that we seek 
in the world. There are very few places where we can have these types of conversations and learn about the power of the intersectionality of psychology and spirituality, which is transformative as it, it's, it takes place in the world. So when, you, we, when we look at spiritual exemplars, Martin Luther King, T Harriet Tubman, Bishop Desmond Tutu, Cesar Chavez, um, who else? So many people, the common thing that they have are spiritual practices and an understanding of pulling away. And I'm, I'm sorry, I left out the most ex exceptional spiritual exemplar, Jesus. <laughs> and so if Jesus pulled away, what is it within us that's being formed? How are we being shaped by our society that makes us feel that we don't need to pull away? These are questions that I'm struggling with. I continue to struggle with these questions. And so as we look at the battles that we're fighting um, in society, capitalism, racial and economic violence, the marginalization that the church is participating in of certain people groups, how do we participate in the work of being agents of moral change through our spiritual disciplines? Are spiritual disciplines really something that are op is, is an option? Or is it something that is necessary? Could it be that the, in, the inner transformation that God wants to work in all of us is why we're here at Fuller? It's not that we only because we're not only here because we want to become good researchers or theologians or intellectually and academically engaged with scripture and psychology, but to be transformed. And so if we're going to be transformed, spiritual disciplines must be part of our practice. And so as I'm taking a class with Dr. Hak Jun Lee, he says, controlling the emotions of fear, anxiety, and hatred has been intimately associated with spiritual disciplines. And so as you stated, contemplative practices, it's not a matter of will, it's a gift from God. And so I'm wondering, I have some questions for you. I came for help today, that's why I'm here. <laughs> I need help. And so in this struggle, in my own struggle, I came across the teachings and some of the writings of Thomas Aquinas and the, philosoph the philosopher Boethius, who wrote, the soul of a man must needs be free while it continues to gaze on a divine mind, and less so when it stoops to bodily things. And so, if greatly influenced by this philosopher, Thomas Aquinas describes the active life of, as bondage and the contemplative life as freedom. And so, if we are to do the work of helping to set captives free from various bondages that we ourselves are acquainted with but silent about, then it seems that, that the practices that we're learning about today, the things that we're learning in Dr. Strong's integration class, the times where the school is calling us away for one day retreat, for silence, which is really sometimes not well attended, I'm just challenging all of us, including myself, to think about that. So I'm wondering, I have questions. Can I ask? Okay. I'm wondering um, if you could share some of your thoughts about the spiritual struggles that are behind the resistance to these practices. A lot of times we're called to these practices and we know about the outcomes, but we don't talk about the struggle and how to confront them in our own lives. My second question is, what are some things that we can walk away with today to think about that will foster in us a greater desire to pull away and commune more deeply with God? And lastly, and I can re-ask these, given what we're learning today, how are Christian psychologists and theologians, particularly those who are trained here with this integrative model, in a unique position to help those who are suffering. We talk about contemplative practices being empowering. We saw that through the civil rights movement. That was a huge part of the civil rights movement that a lot of people don't really talk about. It wasn't only that he was a great orator, he was deeply rooted in his spiritual practices. So there was an otherworldliness about the movement that we usually don't really discuss. 
but as agent and as a moral agent of change, I'm interested in being transformed inwardly so that I can be a part of the solution in the world that we live in. Thank you. Thank you.